about the laparoscopic misinfundication, the rise, the fall, and the re-rise or the re-emergence of this procedure. Now, when I talk about misinfundication, I usually talk about open. When I say laparoscopic missing or lap missing, we're talking about the laparoscopic version of that surgery. So, thanks to everybody for having me. I'm glad everyone's here today at, or at the diagnostic conference or what I like to call free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start by understanding the basics. What causes GERD? Now, Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, says if you cannot simply explain it, then you simply do not understand it. That's a paraphrase. And he's right. So I try to keep everything as simple as possible in discussing. So what is gastroesophageal reflux disease? Ah, start with the diagram. Here we go. So we look, we have the stomach, and it's full of acid, and it's represented in this liquid here. And what happens is that <coughs> at the time when the stomach is churning, the lower esophageal sphincter is closed or it's cut off. And when it is incompetent, as you can see by the flashing red arrow, that liquid, that acid goes rushing back up into the esophagus from there. But that's not the only reason we might have gastroesophageal reflux disease. The other one would be hiatal hernia. Now, even if you have a competent lower esophageal sphincter, when you have a hiatal hernia, basically the lower esophageal sphincter is pulled up into the chest cavity. And uh, this is a, a Frank Netter drawing. In medical school, we used to say in anatomy, it's not, never like Netter when you do the dissection. Netter always did nice drawings from here. And what he's trying to show is two different things here. And one is a congenitally <coughs> shortened esophagus, and the other one is a sliding hiatal hernia. And um, so why would a competent lower esophageal sphincter being pulled up into the chest cause this kind of pain, so if you're a pain, like, look, he's got a little target on him, so he's really hurting badly. That's because in the chest, when we take a deep breath, we're basically creating negative pressure zone. So if we take a deep breath, the diaphragm comes down, increases intra-abdominal pressure, decreases pressure within the chest, the air comes rushing into the lungs, the lungs expand, you have a hiatal hernia, and now all that acid goes rushing up into the negative, um, pressure zone and right up to the esophagus and we suffer from reflux. So two main reasons when we're talking about GERD, especially the surgical repair, is incompetent lower esophageal sphincter and a hiatal hernia. So let's talk about Rudolf Nissen. Rudolf Nissen was a German surgeon who actually was World War I veteran. And his father was a, was a famous surgeon back in the time. He left Germany when the Nazis came into power. And he moved around the United States and uh, uh, Switzerland as well. And when he was in Switzerland, he had a guy came into him. This was about 1948. And the guy had such severe, erosive, ulcerated, reflux esophagitis, he felt that the only thing he could do was to resect the lower part of the esophagus, the upper part of the stomach, which we call the cardio, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then he wanted to reinforce his suture. So he wrapped the fundus of the stomach around it and he found out something that the man no longer had reflux. It wasn't until eight years later, after many failed ex uh, a trial with using conventional surgery that he was able to uh, come up with. He, he went back to what he had done and he came up with the Nissen fund in 1956. And yes, that was an open abdominal thoracic approach from it. And here's a little picture of Rudolf Nissen looking quite mean and angry from there. And uh, if I saw him as a medical student, I'd be scared going to surgery. So. Now, Nissen was famous before he came up with the fundification. He, he, if you operate on somebody famous, you automatically become famous. So Nissen did a surgery on a particularly famous person in 1948 in the United States. And that person wrote a thank you note to Nissen and he said, To Nissen my tummy, the world my tongue. 
And that came back as when he was leaving the hospital after the surgery, which was not a Nissen fund location, by the way. He came out and was met by a bunch of reporters, and he stuck his tongue out at the reporters. <laughs> And this is where the picture came from. <laughs> this is where Albert Einstein's picture came from. Now, Albert Einstein went in to uh, get a surgery for what we call intestinal cysts, which I still don't understand what they were called, but, he, but what they are. But what he had was a, was a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. We didn't have the technique for the Dacon graft then in 1940. So Nissen had basically one thing he had read about. He wrapped the aorta in the cellophane. What did he do? Albert Einstein went on to live two more years. He later died from what was called irritation of the gallbladder, which wasn't. Basically, the abdominal aortic aneurysm ruptured through the cellophane and eventually killed him. Now, why would a medical, or why would someone write that Albert Einstein died of irritation of the gallbladder? What do you think, Chris? Why did he write that? Yes, the gallbladder was irritated from the blood. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it was a it was a um, pyramid scheme to get into general surgery, and if you blame the surgeon, then you lost your spot. That was it. So you learn to shut up and come up with something else. All right, so let's go back to the anatomy now of the stomach. There's a mistake in this, but I put this up here because it was the best one I could find and all that. And I'm actually going to ask uh, Courtney, you're sitting over there by yourself. <laughs> let's talk about the stomach here real quick, and you're going to tell me where the mistake is. We have the um, squamous stratified epithelium in the inside of the esophagus. Do we get to the sphincter? We have this part of the stomach called the cardia, the fundus here, the body of the stomach, like pylorus, or they call it the pyloric sphincter, or pylorus, yet they use the word pylorus again here. What should that be called? I'm always taking a biopsy from it. I know, I know. I know. Yeah. You got the antrum, the body, antrum. Yeah, I'm always taking a biopsy from it. Antrum, that's it. Antrum. That's the antrum of the stomach. Antrum is famous because those are where the G cells are. The G cells produce gastrin, which stimulate the cells in the rest of the body of the stomach to produce acid. So, in the old days, in the 50s, oh, it's hard for me to think of the 50s as the old days. <laughs> Back when general surgeons always operated on the stomach, the most common operation was to take out the antrum, to do a Billroth 1 or 2, because they had peptic ulcer disease. You take out the G cells, you do not produce any more acid because you're no longer getting gastric stimulation. So, in the Nissen fundication, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to kind of increase the, the pressure of the, uh, the resting pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter, which really doesn't matter that much. I'll get into that in a minute. We're also trying to reproduce this area here called the cardia. And what we do is we take the fundus, wrap it behind the esophagus, and so to up in front there. That is really what we're trying to do. Again, the mechanism of action increased the resting lower esophageal pressure, lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Yes and no. That really doesn't have much. The recreation of the cardio, the recreation of the physiological anatomy, apparently has a lot more effect on this. So you don't really try to make it a tight nissen because people can't swallow at the end. You really try to make a loose nissen so that you kind of create that angle back and people get automatic relief from it. And again, there's the picture. What we're trying to do is take this fundus here and wrap it around like I showed in the picture to recreate that cardio. But what was the problem with the Nissen fund? Remember, it's an open fundification. What was the problem? Lots. Dysphagia, 40%. Drug swallowed. And actually, it's very common. It usually resolves. But I suspect that they were thinking, we've got to recreate that lower central sphincter, so they made them tighter, and people had trouble swallowing. Recurrence, 25%. Came back. It failed. Gas bloating. Michelle. Sure. <laughs> People have reflux. Why do they gas why do they get gas bloating? Why do they always filling up their stomach with gas? Swallow air? Yes. Called air phasia. 
why would they swallow air? Gas. I mean, the acid coming up into the esophagus. They're swallowing that air to try to force that acid right back into the stomach there. Okay? And in doing so, they get used to it. They don't think about it anymore. And so, yes, gas bloating is common. And what I usually do is I sit down with the patients and say, you're going to have to learn not to do this. You're going to have to become aware that you do it. And after surgery, you're going to have to learn not to do it. Now, if you do a tight nissen, people really have trouble belching again. And I always prepare them. I said, sometimes people aren't able to belch. But if you do it loose enough, they can belch again. And that's what happens when you get to swallow all that air. Instead of waiting to go through, sometimes it comes back up. <clears throat> Unplanned vagotomy. It's a nerve that runs an anterior posterior along the esophagus. If you take both of them out, uh, then basically your stomach's not going to work anymore, so you try to avoid that. <laughs> Unplanned. <sighs> Failure to relieve symptoms. That means your diagnosis was wrong in the first place. It wasn't acid reflux that was causing the problems. It probably was something else. Perforation of the esophagus in the stomach, it does occur. And unplanned splenectomy, because coming from the fundus straight to the spleen are the short gastric arteries. And if you just get a little too aggressive and get too far over to the spleen on the left side, you can injure it, it's going to bleed. Don't try to bover it, don't try to cauterize it. Do what you can, but sometimes you're going to have to take the spleen out. And all that together equals a bad reputation. So the openness and fundification began to have a bad reputation. How did that equate? Then we saw the begin the era of medical management, the introduction, introduction of histamine 2 receptor blockade. Zantac is a good example, proton pump inhibitor. This was a great paper in the British Journal of Surgery in 1990. They noted that in the 1980s the referral for misinfundications open had dropped by almost 88%, almost 90%. So pretty much just dropped off the face. So now we have the era of medical management. Do not worry about it, missing notifications anymore. Although in 1991, Bernard de la Mange, who was a Belgian uh, surgeon, introduced the laparoscopic approach. In the 80s, we began laparoscopic surgery. OBGYNs did it long before we did. We finally caught up with them and realized this was a great technique. Anyway, so we decided what can we do laparoscopically and we started messing around to see what could be done. And now we brought back the Nissen fundification from there. And this is uh, this is Bernard Delamange right here. All I had was a little picture of him. Nice looking guy. He did, he did the world a favor by bringing the surgery back. So are you saying you had a treatment looking for a disease? <laughs> So it was basically, uh, what can we do? And we've done a lot of silly things like laparoscopically, but yes. So now you're right, because now we have the medical management of GERD, so why should we even be doing this? Well, yeah. But now we started, it began to develop its own reputation as a treatment without having, I'll go into a little bit more details about it, into the treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease surgically. And I'll, again, I'm giving a little bit more of the details than that. So they develop a set of criteria, and this actually comes from the SAGES, which is the um, Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. And they say that one, criteria number one, you fail medical management. You try, you know you have reflux, they've done all kinds of studies on you, they can almost stand across the room and smell the acid coming out of your mouth, and uh, you cannot tolerate, you take an this medication and you still have symptoms. Number two, you're happy with medical management, but you know you're 30 years old and you've got a lifetime of taking medicine and you're not looking forward to that, spending all the money, and you're thinking, if I get the surgery, then I don't have to worry about it later on, okay? Or I don't want to pay for all my medicine, but my insurance will pay for me to come up and go get the surgery. Uh, you have complications of reflux. Now you've got to have the reflux. Those complications include Barrett's esophagus. What is Barrett's? Norman Barrett's came up with this. Basically, it is where the stratified uh, endothelium of the esophagus have been bathed so much in acid that they begin to change to almost to almost like stomach cells, columnar. And now we believe, although I, I'm, I'm certain it's never been fully proved, that with constant change and all that, you begin to get unusual cells, and there becomes the error of lower esophageal